When you look at a turbine system, you should think of three components. One is the blades, one is the generator, and one is the inverter. We have engineers assigned to each stage of that development, and they have poured over existing documents, existing literature, other designs, invented our own IP, our own product uh, philosophy through it all. So we have very efficient blades starting from the ground up. We've developed a very efficient permanent magnet generator. We've spent a lot of time developing the right configuration for this product. The inverter has over 300,000 lines of code in it. It's a very complex device to develop, but once it's done, it's very simple to use. The blades, of course, are the prime mover. They capture the energy out of the wind. We basically took a commercial two megawatt type wind turbine blade and shrunk it to two meters long. As far as we know, no one has done that before. To develop something like this, it took an engineer probably six months. It takes a lot of simulation work, a lot of understanding about airfoils. There's a different airfoil shape here than at the tip. How do you blend that together and make a nice smooth uh, um, product? We have some vortice generators here. Something similar you'd see on an airplane wing. So it's, the idea is to have the, um, the wind come in and stick to the blade longer. So very efficient blades, uh, over 40% efficient with these. Very basic tail. We have an um, upwind design, so wind comes through the turbine and needs to be directed. So this tail keeps it aligned. This is based on the F-22 fighter tail. So that's why it looks so good. A turbine system is far more complicated than one person can design. You need a good team to do it right. And almost all companies I know only do one aspect of it. They build a wind turbine, they have to source the inverter. And then you got the inverter company and the turbine company fighting each other because they're blaming each other on poor production. We can have a meeting with our engineering team and say, this is the data, how do we find a solution? We can design the whole system, including the tower. I can basically walk down the hallway and talk to the inverter designer, or I can walk down the hallway and talk to the blade designer. That's a real strength. We like to think that we've moved wind turbine technology, small wind turbine technology in particular, into the 21st century. I believe that engineers take it to the next level. We get a lot of calls from what I call garage guys. They have the next greatest turbine, it's awesome, but they're usually missing one or several aspects of the whole system. They may have come up with a good blade, but they can't do the generators. Or maybe they've got uh, a tower design that's unique, but they can't seem to fit their turbine on it. With the staff we have here, we've looked at it as an engineering problem. I believe that wind turbines are best suited for rural applications. The wind is cleaner, it's higher average wind speeds. That's why they put wind farms on lonely hill slopes and, and, and uh, mountains, because there's lots of wind there. Cities tend to slow wind down. You usually got trees around it or other homes or other buildings. That adds turbulence and that slows the wind down, both negative things for wind turbines. Solar is very good for uh, uh, deep urban developments on your roof or wherever. Wind is very good in the countryside. So we have three moving parts. One is the yaw, so this turns into the wind. One is furling, which this furls backwards. So as wind speed increases, this goes backwards, looks like a helicopter. And then as wind speed dies down, it comes back down. And up here we have the generator. So the generator is housed in here. Basically super magnets that rotate around some coils that create electricity. And that's what's the third axis of movement is this one. So as, it, as the wind increases, it turns this and creates electricity that way. To look at something like this, there's probably six months of engineering for two engineers to do the mechanical and the electrical, a year of testing, you discover things in the field that you don't on the bench.
trying to get this off the ground is easily the hardest thing I've ever done. I worked hard at Qualcomm, at the same time did my PhD. I had three kids at the same time. My father died right in that, that time frame. That was a lot of stress and a lot of work. This is easily harder than that. There's just a never ending stream of work that you have to get done, but it's so rewarding once, once somebody comes up, buys your product and you hear from them two months later and say, this is an incredible product that you have. It's producing X amount of kilowatt hours. I'm amazed you've done a great job. That's, that's really the pat in the back that we like to get once in a while. There's a big economic push to support African electrification. So at the village level, um, they want to electrify villages with renewable energy. And we've been approached in the last month probably by four or five groups asking about our product. Is it easy to install? Again, all the aspects we've worked into it are playing to our advantage. It's, it's simple to install. It's lightweight, so the shipping's lower. It's easy to understand, so the electrical diagram's very easy to, to understand. So all those things are really playing well into third world countries. And we've had um, requests from South Africa, Namibia, Ivory Coast, Ghana. They're like the Midwest was in the 1930s. Just getting a wind charger up, get a radio going, and now, nowadays it would be a TV, maybe a computer and a few lights, that's it. Very light demand. When I talk to them and, and they think that their electrical demand is high, for instance, one rancher has 17,000 acres that, that he has cattle on. And he goes, well, I've got a house and I've got these watering bowls and there's a lot of electrical demand. I'm like, okay, how much? And he's like, I've got an 80 watt solar panel that, that hooks up to a DC motor to pump water. And I'm like, really? Because we're, we're like 10 times that size. So we have no problem meeting their electrical demands at that scale. We're looking at um, rapid industrialization and commercialization of, of Western technologies in, in these places. You know, and there's a population that's, that's um, estimated to grow exponentially in the next 20 to 30 years. And you can see that the, the stars are really converging, the stars are aligning uh, for an incredible demand in terms of energy in the developed parts of the world, um, particularly Africa. Most of the least developed countries, which have uh, very low income per capita, are in Africa and you see many smaller countries, uh, some with resources, uh, others without. They don't have the money to build nuclear power plants. And the nuclear power plants cost you know, tens, hundreds of millions to build, and when they're done, which is in maybe 10 or 15 years, they can start producing power. Africa's gonna need that power now. Uh, it's gonna need it in small villages uh, rather than large urban areas because the population is still quite diverse, uh, and it's gonna need it cheaply. So the focus now is on how we make sure that we get in at the ground level and meet their energy demands with renewable energy that isn't going to create those carbon emissions. Because if we take what we're already doing in the West in terms of carbon emissions and we then complement that, uh, exacerbate that with what's going to happen in the developing world with fossil fuels, then there is no doubt.